med alla vänliga att sätta sig ner så är det snart dags för nästa talare. Welcome, Kevin. Uh, Kevin is a professor of marketing at uh, the Tuck School of Business at the Dartmouth College in the U.S. Um, he is teaching uh, his students. He is also working as a consultant uh, within large global brands and prominent organizations around the world. Um, and then, of course, he is the professor taking care of the academic work and the research at the Dartmouth College. A big applause for Kevin Lane Keller. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks so much. So now I was, I was told that this is half in Swedish and half in English. Is that right? So, so Jan, am I, am I the English part? Is that right? It's the English part, right? No Swedish, right? So I can't use my Swedish? Ah, oh, well, I'm sorry. It's going to be in English. Um, so, but no, it's great to be uh, back in Sweden. I've uh, been here three or four times uh, in the past. And so this is a great chance to spend some time uh, today. I love the theme of the conference about addressing challenges. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, sort of proven strategies and you know, challenging marketing uh, conditions, if you will. So uh, a little bit real quick, a little bit more, I guess, on my background is, is it pertains to this talk. So I have a couple textbooks. Uh, one's with Phil Kotler, marketing management textbook. I know it's used in Sweden uh, a lot. Uh, that textbook basically is revised over time, periodically, I've just finished the uh, 14th edition, which comes out this year. Uh, my other textbooks deal with branding and brand management, and I'm in the process of revising those. So when you revise textbooks, you're always thinking about what new things to bring in and what old things to keep. And that's kind of the theme of my talk today. Uh, the other thing is I, I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of top companies through the years. And these companies you lift, li, you are listed up here, and just yesterday I had a chance to spend the morning with Google Sweden, Swedish office, which was great. It, the companies up here are the ones I've had sort of multiple engagements through the years. So they're ones I've had, you know, sometimes long-term relationships with. And when you do that, then again, you have a chance to think and reflect about what things should you do differently and what things should you keep the same. And that's, again, what I'm going to talk about. So I put a slide up here. I'm not going to go through it all because you hear this sort of over and over again. I don't think we need to reiterate all these different changes. You know, there are a lot of changes technologically. There are a lot of changes in terms of uh, the way the consumer has, has uh, changed in their empowerment, if you will, the way they shop, the way they buy. There's a lot of changes with globalization, sensitivity to corporate social responsibility, set, you know, on and on. I mean, you've heard this a lot, so I'm not going to go through all those. We're certainly aware that things are very different now than they were maybe 15, 20 years ago. Well, here's how marketing's not changed. And I think you heard that already today uh, in terms of the importance of an enduring importance of strategy. So marketing's, marketing must still always stay close to the consumer. It must always add value, and I'm going to come back to that. So that's a really important thing that hasn't changed. Um, two, you must develop powerful brand strategies, powerful marketing strategies. You've still got to figure out what you think, what you want to do in the marketplace with your brands and your marketing. Uh, three, you're still going to have some form of push and pull. Again, I'll talk about this more in a few minutes. But the whole notion of how do I distribute my products is how as well as how do I communicate. I mean, that's still going to happen. You still have to sell and you have to sell, and you have to distribute your products. And then finally, you still have to think about the, the what exactly is the return on my marketing investment. I mean, that's not changed. And if anything, that's become more important. So I still have to think about accountability and what that return is. So what's the key to marketing success? So there's a lot of things changing, and I think, obviously, there's some things that are not. So what are the keys? Well, the keys to me are you got to tackle old problems, and the old problems are ones that we're still trying to find solutions for, but we know we still have to tackle those. We have to address the new challenges, try to figure out how to incorporate that into our marketing thinking, and doing that in this new environment. It's that combination. And to do so, to me, it's a combination of being analytical, systematic, and being creative and inspired. And I've always said... Marketing's art and a science. There's no doubt about that. The best marketers 
use both sides of their brain. Now, I'm going to talk today in my talk mostly on the analytical side, mostly on the systematic side, but you'll see parts where creativity comes into play. And I'd argue it's, it's always there. I just don't always have time to maybe talk about it. So I'm going I'm to actually give you six marketing imperatives. So I was trying to think about the best way to structure the talk, and I think this is a, is a good way. So six marketing imperatives. I'm going to go through each of those. So I'm not going to go through them now because I'll go through them one by one and recap at the end. And to me, these are the, the key things going forward. And you'll see there's a blend of new and old as we go through these. So first imperative. First imperative is to really make sure you fully and accurately factor the consumer into the marketing equation. And there's an element of old here for sure, because that's the essence of marketing. But what I think is different now is the realization that you better really, really understand what your consumer knows and doesn't know, and what they want and don't want. So there was a concept a while ago, permission marketing. I mean, it's still around, Seth Godin. The notion was, find out what the consumer wants and then just sort of give them that information. It's no longer interruption marketing, it's permission. The consumer gives you permission. I love the concept, great concept. The only issue with, for me is consumers don't always know what they should be asking for. So I talk about participation marketing. So they're actually going to participate with you and, and you're going to help them understand what questions they should be asking, what information they may want and how you might give it to them. So that's kind of the start point to me, is this notion of participation marketing. Re re realizing there's so many different consumers, so many different kinds of consumers, and they vary in terms of, they all have the opportunity now to be more involved with your brand, but they all may not choose to do so. And they all may not know exactly what they want from you. So you have to figure out and work with them for that. Participation marketing is what I call it. So I'm going to give you examples of brands who I think are doing a good job at each of these imperatives and raise different issues in the process. I'm going to start with Nike. So the whole notion of, of being really focused on the consumer, I think, is one of the strengths of Nike. And again, I'm going to share with you who I, some of the companies I think are doing some, some really good marketing. So uh, Nike has a mission. If you go to their website, go to their website, they have a mission. And their mission is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world, okay? And when you go to the website, there's a little asterisk at the end of this. And down below is a footnote. It says, and if you have a body, you're an athlete. So congratulations to you all, okay? We're all a group of athletes here just, you know, learning about marketing today. But, you know, that's actually a really important statement by Nike because what it says and what it means is that Nike is not just marketing to the world's elite athletes who are trying to shave a hundredth of a second off their times. They're basically marketing to everyone, even that person who's just trying to get off the couch or the sofa and maybe walk around the park a little bit to get some exercise and be a little more fit. Huge statement for them to make. So it's, to them, it's all about sort of this access point. One of the concepts that Nike talks about I love is they talk about the access point to their brand. How broad is the access point? How relevant is your brand to how many different people? And brands vary by how far their access point goes. Benetton at one time had, remember, united colors of Benetton, colorful clothes for colorful people, right? People of all colors. And that was very inclusive. And then they went into that shock advertising. So, you know, dying AIDS patients and boat people and just really a lot of grim images. And they went very, very exclusive. Their access point narrowed. Now it's broader again. So you can decide how to play that, but however you define your access point, and Nike's is broad, you've got to make sure you really understand that consumer. And that's what Nike does. They work with the athletes, but they work and think about the, the, the athletes who are not the world-class athletes. The other thing Nike has, they have a set of values that drive what they do, but they have something called a brand mantra. And I love brand mantras. They're three to five word expressions that capture the essence of a brand. And Nike's is authentic athletic performance. So that's what everything they do comes down to that. Whether it's when they, as they moved into 
clothing and apparel from shoes, the question was, how does it live up to authentic athletic performance? And that's when they introduced, if you remember, dry fit, which was completely new sort of running apparel, new technology, okay? So it's, it's really important. So they have a clear view of who they are, what they are, and work with the consumer and have that kind of connection. Um, another brand that's fascinating is Virgin in this regard, because Virgin has a very broad brand promise. And their mission, which is, again, basically on their website, is to go into categories where customer needs are not well met and just, and just deliver it a much, much better experience. So do different things and do things differently. And when they're at their best, that's exactly what they do. And that's where they've excelled in Virgin Atlantic and, and, and some other of their different initiatives. They've got to be careful because they have a lot of different brands and products out there, or sub-brands, I guess. And, and, and where I think they get into trouble is when they go into categories where consumer needs are basically pretty well met. So Virgin Cola. So, you know, Pepsi, Coke, people are probably not that dissatisfied with that. Virgin Vodka. There's already like a thousand brands of vodka, okay? We're not clear that there was a need for maybe another brand of vodka. So Virgin at their best goes into categories, finds out about the consumer, what they want, what they don't want, what they know, what they don't know, and then just delivers a great experience. Second imperative is we start with a consumer because we always do. Second imperative is about going beyond product performance and developing sort of more emotional and going beyond the rational benefits to more emotional benefits, and in particular thinking about the role of design to do so. So it's thinking about saying, look, we've, performance is critical, but we also want to think about the emotional side. Strong brands, good marketing has a duality. There's a functional side and there's an emotional side. What you do and what you represent. And so Apple is kind of the, the classic example because they've taken design in its fullest sense because design is all about how a product works, it's about how a product looks, and it's about how a product feels. So it's the functional, but it's also the experiential aspect of that. So they combine that in their design. Um, so it's the functional emotional benefits. And, and the interesting thing with Apple, and we've heard a lot about it recently, interesting thing about Apple is the fact that the, their whole product development strategy, they've stuck to the design as they've gone forward. What they've done, though, they've got the classic example of the benefits of a successful brand extension. If you look at what they did when they introduced the iPod, when they introduced iTunes, that did three things for them. Three things. One is he created a new category. So now they've got a whole new category. They've created a huge category. Two, it strengthened their parent brand. So now people are actually thinking about Apple that they didn't necessarily think about before. Three, gives them permission to go into another category. So it expands their boundaries. Brands grow through little steps. I'll talk about that more in, in a second. So that was the beauty of that. And the one thing that's interesting, and, it, and they've got great you know, personality and advertising and, and all those different things. Um, the one thing that people don't always realize and give credit to in terms of Apple, what happened was they expanded their channels. And that was really key. Go back to this concept of access point. So one of the issues Apple always had was they basically sold through their own channels, stores, et cetera, until the iPod and iTunes because then it became very democratic. They started selling the iPod in lots and lots of different uh, channels. So major retailers, major appliance retailers, kiosks. So I flew, I flew out of Boston Logan Airport. In the international section, there's a kiosk. It's from Best Buy's, the retailer, where you could buy an iPod if you wanted. So that's totally different. So one of the, one of the things, as much as we talk about the design, which I think is crucial, and all the personality, one of the things that people may not give them enough credit for or give enough credit for their success to is the fact they expanded their channels because that broadened their access point. Brought a lot of people into this extension, and then they saw the benefits of the feedback and the stretch that they got uh, out of that. So another example is uh, Pampers. 
So one of the things Procter & Gamble did, and Procter & Gamble has been a very interesting company over the last uh, 10 years or so because they've, done, they've really changed things a lot in their marketing, tried to get better and better at marketing. And they, and they had a very good decade throughout kind of the 2000s. So it was very good for them. One of the things they did early on was try to think about their positioning more carefully in their products and how they sort of worked for consumers. Because, because Procter & Gamble traditionally was very functionally positioned. And Pampers was a great example. Pampers is their biggest brand. And Pampers was the classic sort of, it was all about a functional benefit. It was all about dryness. It was all about the idea of absor absorbency. And so they would have these ads, these demonstration ads. You might have seen those in the past where basically it's the Pampers diaper and then there'd be like the other diaper and they'd pour colored water into the diapers, and the Pampers diaper would hold more of the water, which meant the baby would be drier, you know, your baby. Which, so clear functional benefit, clear performance. You want dryness, go with Pampers. End of story. So about 10 years ago, they said, well, let's think through this a little bit more in terms of, well, what's truly the emotional payoff? Because ultimately, consumers are always making all their decisions rationally and emotionally, and you want to try to tap into both of those. So they did this across a lot of brands. Well, in the Pampers case, if a baby's dry, what are the benefits of that? Well, so the baby, if the baby stays dry at night, they sleep better for one. So one benefits, the parents sleep better. That's not unimportant. But the key benefit is the baby sleeps better. So the next day, the baby's better rested, the baby's better able to play, learn, etc. So why don't we think of Pampers as caring for baby's development, playing a role in that process by helping the baby sleep better, be more active, etc. It's a very different approach. So that changes the way you think of what you do on your website, changes the way you think of your product development, changes the way you think of your advertising. And Pampers now, I think it's a six billion dollar brand. They had a great decade, very successful. And I, I'd argue it's because they really found the functional and emotional benefits connected them really well and just delivered on it going forward. So that's the Pampers story. So, so evolved it from absorbency, caring for baby's development, and then basically pushed it out through all that they did uh, going forward. So here's the third imperative. Sort of started with sort of the customer, start, started talking about the importance of the emotional and design the aesthetics as well as the actual performance itself and the emotional payoffs. The third one, and this is, a, this is one of those going back where we're constantly trying to do a better job, and that's integration. So integration is something that we talked about 25 years ago and we're talking about you know, in 2011. So how can we actually make sure that we have a truly integrated marketing program? The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. One plus one equals more than two. How can we do that? How can we put things together? My theme is to mix and match. So my theme is to mix and match. And so, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk about Red Bull briefly, and then I'm actually going to go through a little bit of depth on this particular imperative because there are a lot of interesting issues here. So Red Bull, actually, I, I, I think it's a fascinating brand. It's not that old. It only left Austria and started being sold in other parts of Europe in kind of the mid-90s. So, you know, it's funny. It seems like it's been around a long time. Not really. Uh, they're really integrated, you know, from the start. They have a great set of brand elements just from a brand perspective. The name, the logo, the, the can, the, can this, the slogan, Red Bull gives you wings, right? Vitalizes mind, body, and spirit. Uh, but they've done a lot of stuff in terms of, of the push side of their marketing program, the channel side. So a lot of make sure their product was available in the right places at the right times, it, if needed, putting refrigerators in, things like that. But they've also done a lot on the pull side, obviously, to create a strong brand to, on the communications. And, and, and it's traditional and non-traditional, and that's one of the things I like about them, so they do advertising, they do sponsorship, they do you know, various kinds of things uh, online now. They've got a much, uh, look at their website. So if, if you look at the uh, events that they do, 
they do traditional events and non-traditional events. So they sponsor lots of racing, you know, cars and motorcycles, lots of different things. But then they create their own events. So if you can see up here on the right-hand side, the middle scene there is something from something called Crashed Ice. Crashed Ice is something they do in uh, different cities. Uh, Quebec is one that I know of in North America, but they do them in Europe. So what they do is they, they, find, they find a city with, the, with a, a huge hill, and they put an ice track down that hill. And then basically what they do is they have contests to see who's the fastest down this hill on skates. But you're not just doing it by yourself. You're doing it with three or four other people who are going to be bumping into you. It's a little bit, if you know roller derby, which is on the roller skates, it's kind of the ice version of this. It's pretty wild. And so they have it in, in a Quebec City. They did it at night. This unbelievable track, old Quebec City, lights on, 100,000 people there. It's televised. It was unbelievable. And they're sampling Red Bull, and they have the signs, and Red Bull gives you wings, right? Helps you fly down the, down the course. The one you might be more familiar with is Flugtag. How many people have been to a Flugtag here in Stockholm? Anyone? Okay, raise your hands. Don't be shy. Okay. So uh, they have them all through Europe and North America, Latin America. Flugtag Flying Day. So as you can see here, it's basically all about you know, how far you can go on a man-made, man-powered flying machine off a tower into a body of water because you're not going to fly. Okay, so you're going to land in water. So it's safe. Uh, and, you know, it's the same thing. Gets hundreds of thousands of people, if you will. I've seen it in Hamburg is where I've seen it in Germany. Um, yeah, it's a big party. Uh, it's a lot of fun, but it's very consistent with the brand. Red Bull gives you wings. You sample. And, you know, some people take it seriously. Like this person here is pretty serious. They got the wings. I mean, they're really going for this, all right? Some people, like they're in a bathtub, okay? They're not going to fly in a bathtub, all right? So it's just fun. But, you know, they do that, but they also have their traditional advertising, the, the cartoon ads that they've run for years, right? The fables. They run those in countries all over the world. So they can't combine things in different ways, and I'll come back to that. So let's talk about building brand equity. So Red Bull, I think, is a good example. They've been remarkably successful. Um, you know, it's many challenges they face now, but they've had a, a, a really wonderful 15, 16-year uh, run as they've expanded that brand. So obviously, uh, when it comes to the, this marketing imperative in terms of building the equity side of things, to me, it's all about brand contacts because every contact matters. It affects what people think, what they feel, what they experience. The power of a brand resides in the minds of your consumer. So one of the things I'll say is consumers own your brands. They always have and they always will because the power of a brand is here and here. What people think, what people feel, and maybe here, what people spend money on. Okay, that's the power of a brand. What I don't think has changed is I don't think consumers own brand management, okay, because that's different. Brand management is not something they necessarily want to do. That's not their, they didn't apply for that job, okay. They have jobs, they have families, so they don't necessarily want to manage your brands. They maybe want to be involved, but maybe only some of them. So I'm going to come back to this theme, but that to me is really important. Because empowerment is empowerment. It means you are empowered. It doesn't mean you're, you're actually going to do it. It means you can if you want. And so they will, one way or another, those brands reside, the power resides in the minds of the consumer, no question. That's always the case. So as marketers, long-term brand asset value for the shareholder value, i got to build strong brands. I, it affects, it's what I'm able to get people to think, feel, and experience. But brands management's a different story. So it's, it's every brand contact matters, and at the heart of a great brand are great products and services. And that's crucial. So we can talk as much as we want about communications and channels. If I don't have the right product, it's going to be really hard in a marketing sense to be successful. But most, most good marketers can go beyond that, and great brands go beyond that, because they realize that's not enough. So I've, I was at Stanford University for years, uh, Silicon Valley, and I worked with the technology companies. So many examples, great technology products, marketing failures, okay? So it's necessary but not sufficient. The marketing uh, comes in and it's crucial. So I want to talk about, you know, all different aspects of this. And I want to start with value. 
I'm going to talk about channels, communication, and value. Let me start with value. Because I think especially now, and you know, whether, whether we're all going into a double dip or not, I'm not sure. Okay, we certainly experienced one sort of slowdown, and we may be moving into another. But value is the, the definition. If you think about it, so the importance of value is, is you want to make sure that you're not just competing on price. You're not just playing the discount game. That's not a good game to play. So to me, it's always been and always will be about value and creating good value for uh, customers. Value is basically the sum of all the sort of benefits and costs. All the benefits and costs, tangible, intangible. And so to me, one of the, ch one of the challenges and one of the imperatives in marketing is to get your customers to not just focus on price. Because that's often ignoring a lot of other factors that can be really important. So I don't want to play the price-cost game because I better be, as a marketer, giving them more benefits than that. There's psychological benefits, the time, energy, peace of mind, all those logistical, psychological benefits that I, and costs that I want to factor in. So often where you get into trouble is when that consumer oversimplifies and ignores a lot of these other costs that actually really favor your brand. So you better understand value in its totality all the benefits, tangible, intangible, all the costs, tangible, intangible, and manage that equation. And that's critical. And to me, you know, you're going to find what you want to do is, is, is make sure, obviously, the collective benefits outweigh the collective costs. And there are times you have to help the consumer understand that value equation. And that's when I talk about sort of framing value. And Procter & Gamble did, is, does, has done this for years because... They've had a, always had a, a fairly premium priced positioning for many of their brands in many of their categories. So they've always had to compete against store brands, private labels, discount brands. And, and they're, they're clever about this. I'll give you one example, and that's the Pantene one that's up on the screen. So Pantene, let's just say it costs, and I'm going to use, uh, U, since I'm talking in English, I'm going to use U.S. currency. So it costs a dollar more in, in, in those terms than uh, the discount brand, store brand. And in tough times, you know, when the economy's hurting, you know, a dollar is a dollar. It's still, you know, more than people may want to pay. So people may be trading down or shifting or switching to, to the store brand, discount brand. So Pantene could be losing. So, well, why not reframe the value? Because they're kind of missing the value equation because they're just simply coming up with the overall cost. Why don't you tell them, if you're P&G, which they did, Look, you get 100 shampoos out of that bottle of shampoo. Just say it's 100. So that basically says you're paying one cent, one penny more per shampoo to use Pantene per shampoo. Isn't it worth like one cent, you know, for get a nicer head of hair, you know, a better shampoo? Because you frame it that way, the unit analysis shifts and it starts to seem, okay, that's not so much maybe. <laughs> maybe it's worth it. So you really have to think through What's the value and how do I communicate the value and how do I maybe frame that? Ikea is a great example in terms of value propositions. So I think understanding your value proposition, developing a business model to satisfy that can be really, really critical. I don't need to tell you about, about Ikea. The, these are two of my favorite examples because they're real recent. And I think it's fascinating how successful Samson has been against Sony the last 15 years. They're worth more interbrand brand value, Samson and Sony right now. If I told you that 15 years ago, you'd say, no way. Because Samson was not that well respected at that time. So clearly they did a lot of things. And a lot of what they did, they did a lot of things with design and quality. So I give them, I give them a lot of credit. You know, great engineering, so the products looked good, worked well, all that. But the other thing they did was they came across with a really attractive value proposition they weren't always as expensive as Sony. I'm not sure about Sweden, but at least in North America, that was part of their success. So now you've got this nice situation where I'm basically matching them, if not exceeding them in some cases, with the quality, design, et cetera, and it's affordably priced. You know, there's no surprise. You know, you've got the value equation figured out. Sony hung in there as long as they did because they had a great reputation themselves that carried them over. And now they're catching up some, or trying to catch up. Hyundai, same story. So it's interesting. The Korean 
brands against the Japanese brands. And that's Hyundai, same story with Toyota. Toyota, the leader for years. Hyundai basically matching it with quality, trying to match it, and maybe exceed it on design a little bit in different ways, and then a more attractive uh, pricing. So you're able to get a better value proposition, gain share, and, and, and try to challenge the, the leader. And Toyota's got their issues right now, anyway. So anyway, so really important, I think, these times especially, value proposition is critical. Um, this slide, and I'm sorry, this is like, I've got a couple slides here that are like um, ridiculously complex. But they're more, they're not for you to sort of study, they're more just for me to make a point, okay? So this point is basically that, look, there's a lot of ways to distribute and to communicate about your brand. They're direct and indirect channels, and they're more or less direct and indirect uh, communications, mass or personal, if you will. And don't worry about all the details. I'm going to talk about some of the things there. But anyway, point being, this is where things have changed a lot. We talked about the product. I talked about the value. That's in the center. Now I've got to think about communicating and distributing in this different world that we live in. Just real quick, a couple things on channels. I'm not going to talk much about this. I wish I had you know, more time. I would. But winning channel, channel strategies, to me, are those that are going to really handle integration well. Because it's all, all about the sh you know, shopping experience with the realization that people now cycle through so many different channels. You may go online, uh, learn a little bit, go to a store, check it out, go back online, learn a little bit more, and then finally buy. Okay, so that means I better have a very integrated channel strategy that understands how this all comes together. And I have to, it has to be effective, it has to be efficient, it has to do all the things that channels have to do. And just as an example, I put these, this is some of the Nike ones, because we were talking about Nike before. I mean, Nike sells a lot of different ways. And this is, I don't think this is all of them, but these are certainly, you know, six key ones, some of which they control, some of which go through retailers or intermediaries, catalogs, online. I mean, there's lots of ways they sell. So basically, it's all about efficiency, effectiveness, and then trying to balance the channel dynamics, if you will, the conflict, the control you get. So, I mean, it's a very, very interesting time when it comes to channels. I think we can get carried away with the communication side because it's fun and, and, and interesting and, and can be very powerful, but channels are crucial. And getting those right are really important in direct and indirect. So again, I wish I had more time, but I'm gonna, I am going to scoot over to communications because um, I did want to touch on this too. So my belief uh, is, I think, and I think I see this in a lot of the, the, the best marketing that, I'm, that I see around these days, is that people are blending three pieces with a fourth piece waiting in the wings a little bit. And the three pieces are basically traditional marketing communications, as well as online and offline activities, interactive, digital, online, as well as events, experiences, sort of the offline world, if you will. And what's waiting in the wings, well, I didn't put up here, I could, and I sometimes do, is mobile. Because with a smartphone penetration, a place, country like Sweden, which is you know, ahead of the curve, that's going to be a marketing priority in the coming years. How, when, all those things. And, and that's, again, another talk, another time. But that's clearly coming on strong just in the last year or two. And you see it a lot in, uh, in North America, and you'll see it, I'm sure, through Europe too. But just briefly, just to say a couple things about each of these three areas. You know, the mass media, I still believe in traditional television and print. It gives you the opportunity to tell your story the way you want to. It gives you a little more control over your message. Okay, at least gives you that chance to put your face forward in the way you want. I still think it's important. I still think you reach people you wouldn't reach otherwise in ways you couldn't do otherwise. So I still support that. Uh, what's interesting is the interactive and how that's changed. And that's where there's a whole lot going on. And there should be. You know, there's so much activity in this area from a consumer standpoint. And my caveat here is on the screen, I basically, on the left-hand side, have a, have a set of the more traditional, if we can call it that now, interactive. And maybe on the right-hand side, the social media, maybe the more newer emergent side of things. And my caveat is don't lose sight of the left-hand side. Because every people gets, can get very caught up in social media, which I'll talk more about in a second. Fact is, search, having a great website, figuring out when to reach people with the right kind of ads online, still really matter. Can still be part of your integrated communication program. Again, my goal is to mix and match traditional 
online, offline, to paint a picture of the brand as a marketer for the consumer with the consumer's involvement in different places in different ways. So that's the way I like to think about it. And I want to make sure I think I, I'm using the right paint brushes and the right colors. Sometimes I'm reinforcing on Volvo and I talk about safety. And I do that in my advertising online. You can go and there are demonstrations or other cool things I can do on my website. And then maybe you, know, you go to a dealer, there are ways you can reinforce the safety message through demonstrations again or something like that. Same time if I'm Volvo and I want to be successful in my positioning, my worry is if I'm known as safe, I want to make sure at the same time that that's my strength but it, all strengths come with weaknesses when it comes to brands. You're good at one thing. In many, my, in many cases, consumers think you're not so good at something else. You're really safe. You know what else you are, potentially? Boring. Okay. Does that mean Volvo has to be exciting? Everyone said that. That was good. Um, does that mean Volvo has to be exciting? No. What does it mean? Volvo has to be not boring. Okay. So maybe that means, as part of my communications, I get involved in sponsorship. I get involved in events. I do things that make Volvo seem very contemporary, very relevant, and not boring, if you will. That's painting the picture. That's mixing and matching. I'm matching safety across a lot of things, but I'm mixing with that a contemporary image because I need both of those to be successful. And that's what communications can do for you. To the right-hand side for a second, social media... Uh, the thing with social media, I think it's great. It does so many things for you. It's, it's, it's just so neat. This is a way we can have these conversations, these dialogues, and involvement with consumers we never could have before. And it really does force companies to be thinking about how are they innovative and how are they relevant. Because what are they going to tell consumers on their Facebook or, or even, for that matter, um, uh, on YouTube or anything like that? What are they going to have to show and share? So it forces companies to think, what are we doing that's new and interesting and relevant? And that's good. Because if you're not innovating and you're not staying relevant, as a marketer, you're in trouble. Okay, you've got to always be moving forward in the right direction. Otherwise, you're going to fall behind. Talk to Sony. Okay, talk to Toyota. Because Samsung and Hyundai are innovating and staying more relevant, at least recently, compared to those two. But here's the caveat. Not everybody's going to participate in social media. Some of the consumers, some of the brands, some of the time. Because again, they're not brand managers. They have lives. They're going to pick and choose those brands that they really care about. And it's certainly a goal and a worthy goal to get consumers involved, but just recognize it's diversity. Diversity in the sense of some people caring a lot, some people caring less. And I want to make sure I market effectively to, to both to make sure I've got a broader access point. So it's an important caveat because I think it's easy to get carried away with social media and not recognize the pyramid, if you will, that you're involved with and you can't just talk to the top of that pyramid. So finally, experiential communications, the last piece, if you will. To me, it's all about education, entertainment, really trying to create some news and excitement and, and doing things to get people involved. And I, my prediction is in the next five years, you're going to see a lot of interest in this because as much as people live in a digital world, they need to live in the human real world too, and they want to do things. And the more you can have them do interesting things, the better off you're going to be. And you can reinforce it digitally, and you can reinforce it with advertising, but I think you're going to want to have some of that. So that's why I have these three pieces to me uh, are really critical. All right, next imperative. Um, next imperative is, is so we've talked about consumers, we've talked about emotions and design, we've talked about integration. This is now, for me, a marketing imperative is about growth. Growth is critical and it's about managing brands and making sure you're doing the right things with brands. Understand where you want to take your brands and how you're going to get there. And here there are really two parts to this. And the first part is about doing the right things with brands. The second part is about cost. So let me talk about each of those. Let's start with the first one. So the first one is saying make sure you, you uh, don't take advantage of your brands. So one of the worries I have, especially for older brands, is the marketers kind of take advantage of them. They over discount them. They over extend them. They over promote them. They over expose them. 
And the worry is, if you're not careful, or you start taking compromises. It's death by a thousand cuts. Little compromises, little decisions you make that really aren't consistent with the brand. They're not really, truly what you should be giving the consumer. But you do it because there's a reason why you do it. And you say, you know, it's not that bad. And it probably isn't that bad by itself. But it's only when you add that bad with that bad with that bad times 100. Death by a thousand cuts. It's the, it's the additive effect of those little decisions. Starbucks is the example I um, uh, you know, we we'll talk about in a second. Oh, I'm sorry. I started. I got a completely wrong story here. I was going on a totally wrong story. <laughs> so let me let me go to my story. Let me go back to because I, now I started the story. I got to finish this story. I went straight to the imperative five. I skipped imperative four. You paid good money. Okay, you deserve all six imperatives, right? <laughs> huh. All right. Oh, geez, that's funny. Um, I just love this imperative so much. I don't know what to say. Sometimes I can't wait. So I'll go back. I'll go back. You were probably figuring out what was going on. Uh, so here we are, managing brands, doing the right thing with, with brands. Uh, this is, so I kind of mixed them up. Doing the right things with brands. Two pieces to this, as I said. Uh, managing brands for the long run, and that's avoiding overexposure, over discounting, you know, doing the, you know, taking advantage of your brand. Starbucks, the example there. Starbucks made a number of little decisions that were done for efficiency purposes. And they probably were okay by themselves, but when you added them up, it fundamentally changed the experience. So Starbucks no longer had the kind of experience the customers expected, and they started to see their sales drop. Howard Schultz came back into the picture, and now they're back on track, okay? Uh, the second one's corporate social responsibility. I think this is a really important one. More and more young people are concerned about this. I think it's all about cause, cause, uh, cause programs, win-win programs. Uh, British Airways changed for good. I love with UNICEF, they've changed it now to comic relief. But the notion was you're traveling one country to another. You have change. You don't really need it. So why not put it in an envelope and, and give it to them? So there's a lot of benefits to, the, to, to, to these. Uh, cause programs. Let me talk a little bit more about each of these. So back to the uh, managing for the long run. So for each of these. Uh, in this case, look at these four different leaders at one point. MySpace, Yahoo, Blockbuster, Barnes & Noble. Ten years ago, they were doing great. Ten years ago or five years ago, market leaders, lots of, lots of promise, lots of potential. What's happened to them now? They've all been taken over by different brands. So Facebook, Google, Netflix, Amazon have all managed to take share away from MySpace, Yahoo, Blo uh, Blockbuster, and Barnes and & Noble. So it's all about making sure, I've got to make sure I'm managing for the long run, staying close to my consumer, doing all these other things, or I'm going to get into trouble. Or in terms of cause marketing, the second one, so managing for the long run, make sure I don't take advantage of my brand, but not only that, do good things for the community. Do good things for the environment. So if you look here, in terms of the benefits of cause marketing, and I'm sorry, I'm going to sweat a little bit. I'm the James Brown of marketing. You know James Brown, soul singer? You know him? OK. I'm the James Brown of marketing. I feel good. I feel good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, all right. Yep, yep, yep. Hardest working professor in marketing right here. No professor works harder than me. All right. All right. Um, but there's so many benefits to a good cause marketing program. So, I mean, I really think this is important. I think it can build your brand. I think it can help your employees with morale. Consumers like that. You can get a, uh, um, a good emotional response. You can get them involved, which is really important online and stuff like that. So the, the program I, I have here on the bottom is the Lens Crafter program, Gift of Sight. So they basically sell eyeglasses. When you go to get a new pair of glasses, you probably don't need your old pair because your eyes have changed. You give them the lens crafters. Lens crafter sends them to Africa, sends them to some part of the world where people can't afford glasses. And then now they have them. It's just a great program. Tom's Shoes, you know Tom's Shoes? Same idea. You buy a pair of shoes and they will give one to underprivileged uh, children. So really, really cool idea. 
All right, so we can't go to this marketing imperative without going all the way back to marketing imperative number four, which we almost skipped, but we're not going to. All right, here we go. Okay, where was I? Um, so as I started off here, so this is about taking a brand in terms of potential, um, understand where you can take a brand and how. There's really sort of, this is about brand architecture. It's about understanding brand potential. And to me, that's one of the most interesting things uh, as a marketer we can think about. What could your brands be? How far can they go? I always think about that as a, as a professor with students. What's my student's potential? How can I help them reach that potential? Same thing with, uh, with uh, uh, marketing. So here, it's a, it's, so when I talk about architecture, it's literally thinking about how do I expand my brand? And there's a naming and a branding part of that. You know, there's a strategic part of that. What's the potential? So uh, here's my example. My example is, uh, is Crayola, crayons. And Crayola, how many people use Crayola crayons when they were young? Is it in Sweden, right? Well, that's pretty much everybody, OK. Um, so Crayola crayons, you know, growing up for me at least was, you know, you, had, you can see that the, the 8, the 24, or here it is, 64 crayons with the built-in sharpener, okay? So as a kid, that meant you made it big. I mean, this is big time, all right? You got the sharpener built in. This is big time. And I'm sure I can imagine Crayola having these discussions about their crayons and thinking about growing and thinking, okay, what can we do? We have eight, we have 24 crayons, 64, but we're only about crayons. So, geez, what do we, how about, how can we grow? Maybe, maybe we can introduce a box of crayons, 48. For that kid who's not quite ready for 64, but just have gone a little bit past 24. You know, they can't handle all those colors, but they just need like a little more color. We'll bring them along. You know, you can imagine these crazy conversations they had about crayon boxes. And then somebody was smart and somebody said, wait a second, you're about colorful arts and crafts. We're about colorful arts and crafts for kids. That's what, really what we're about. We should be selling things besides crayons. So they started with markers, then they moved to all kinds of things. You can see right here, they've got a whole range of things that they sell now. So you go to a store, it's a whole, they're not a shelf, they're a whole section in a store. So it's really, really neat what they've been able to do. Amazon, another great example. So Amazon was smart enough to brand themselves as Amazon, not Books or Us, which is where they started selling. Amazon's a big river. I can put a lot of things on that river, okay? So I, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole slide, but it's amazing how they've grown. And now they're basically a retail merchant that sells everything, okay? And now with the Kindle, they've got doing some really interesting things with books. Again, I'm not going to go through this, but I will say one thing about growth. You grow brands through little steps. You grow brands through taking little steps. Nike started with running shoes, and now they sell everything athletic, clothing, equipment, as well as shoes in all kinds of sports. But they did it through little steps. And the one thing you want to do is you want to make sure, as you're doing extensions, that you're thoughtful. If 90% of new products fail, and 90% of new products are extensions, just say those are the numbers, a lot of extensions are failing. And I'd argue there are a lot of reasons why. A lot of it's they're, they're kind of too many me too. They're, they don't, people don't truly think through extensions. Marketers don't think through them systematically enough. I got a scorecard up here. You don't have to use it. I'm not going to explain it. It basically focuses on the importance of the consumer desirability, com competition, differentiability. Can I differentiate myself? The company deliverability and then feedback effects, four main areas. And that's how you judge extensions. Anyway, but the point being, you have to be systematic. So, so architecture is about understanding your potential and then being thoughtful as you're expanding to go into the right categories the right way with your brands. Okay, running low on time, let's go straight to the sixth imperative. And this is the last one, and this is one about taking a big picture effect, big picture view of marketing effects, understanding why things work, 
and how they work. And it's through models. And I think that models are really crucial for planning, for measurement. You have to have some models of how you understand how consumers think, feel, experience, etc. I have three models I use. They're um, ones that Procter & Gamble and Samson and Ford and some of the different companies I, I work with use. Procter & Gamble especially has, has used these models. And what they are is they're, they're kind of the Russian doll models. One doll goes inside another doll, goes inside another doll. Do you know those? Matrushka dolls, I think they're called. That's the way these models work. One's about positioning. One's about resonance, which is about intense active loyalty relationships. And one's about the value chain. And so given the time... I'm just going to highlight these, okay? So I don't have time to go through these in detail, but I at least want to list these for you so you get a chance to see them. So positioning model, the key thing here, and I, I sort of alluded to this with the Volvo, is it's all about points of difference and points of parity. You need both. To be successful as a marketer with your brands, points of difference are desirable, deliverable, differentiating, just like with extensions. There's the, it's your, any brand, new or existing. Desirable, deliverable, differentiating. Something about you consumers want that you can deliver on that differentiates you. Points of difference have to have them. They're critical. Volvo, safety, you could argue. Uh, at the same time, you have to have points of parity. Points of parity are ones where you break even with competitors. And there are basically three kinds, the category points of parity, necessary. There's the, what I call the competitive points of parity where you negate your competitor's advantage. Visa was successful when they negated American Express's prestige image to some extent. And the third kind is what I call correlational, like Volvo, you're good at one thing, you're maybe bad at another. One of Apple's challenges for years, you're easy to use, you must not be powerful. So they worked really hard to convince people th that they were powerful. This is going back into the 90s. So anyway, so that's the, so points of parity, points difference is a really useful model. It's trying to understand how consumers make decisions and position yourself in the, in the best possible way. That then feeds into this model. This is the resonance model, which uh, Procter & Gamble calls equity scan when they track here in Europe and in other parts of the world. Series of, of building blocks and stages and basically goes through and, and, and ultimately talks about resonance. Resonance is when the customer thinks he or she's totally in sync with the brand. They feel connection. So it's intense act of loyalty. It's characterized by attachment. It's characterized by community. It's characterized by engagement. So all of those things coming together to create what I call resonance. But the only way you get resonance is that people know your points of parity, points of difference, performance imagery, that they think of you in the right times, salience, and they have the right judgments and feelings. And anyway, the model kind of outlines all that. The value chain model, the simple version of this, there's a more complicated version, talks about the marketing activity affecting the customer mindset. The mindset is basically the resonance model. It's all those different resonance, judgment, feelings, performance imager, imagery, points of parity, points of difference, salience, all of that, what's in customers' minds, that in turn affects market performance, which in turn affects uh, shareholder value. So these three models are linked. And again, sorry if uh, I had to go through that fast. I wasn't so concerned that you knew all the details. I like these models. I think they're good. Some of these companies think they're good. But there are certainly other models out there. I think the point is you need to have some models like these. And they better be complete. They better be cohesive. And they better address positioning building loyalty relationships, ROI, all that has to be worked out. So those are my models there. So I'm basically out of time, I think. So let me wrap up. So these are my six imperatives. Uh, this is actually the correct order, just in case you weren't sure. So four does go before five and before six. Um, and then just in conclusion, branding's not rocket science. I tell the story that uh, um, I'm not a rocket scientist, uh, but my dad was. Okay, and so, <laughs> swear to God, it's true. Um, and when I first wrote my book, these marketing books, I had my dad go and read them. He said, geez, Kevin, they're really interesting. But you know what? This is not rocket science, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, what do you say? You know, it's like, well, what do you know? Cause he's a rocket scientist, so <laughs> he's, he's right. Uh, you know, I, I'd argue it's harder because rocket science, 
you have all these equations and things you can solve. I was a math major in college. I'd love that. We don't have that in marketing. It's harder, I'd argue, because they're unspecified equations. Uh, I do think um, going forward that the successful businesses, the ones who are going to build a loyal customer base, are going to achieve profitability in this really competitive, constantly changing digital world, are going to address these six imperatives. And then this, I really think this kind of classic and contemporary, I tried to give you a flavor for that, and some of these trade-offs are going to be really important. So uh, it was a thrill to come back here. I'm really glad you guys had a chance to come. Thanks so much. So, thank you.